I am Dr. Pavitra Bharadwaj. I am Associate Professor in the Department of Computer Science, Jesus and Mary College, University of Delhi. So friends, in the last lecture of this series, we had discussed about data mining and we were looking at, you know, what exactly is data mining uh, and how, you know, how is the need, why, what is the need to have this kind of uh, sophisticated and, you know, highly computative, uh, you know, task of data mining that we cannot achieve using the traditional data methods or the traditional data analysis techniques, right. So, we were looking at certain challenges, you know, which one faces. So, some of the challenges that we had looked at were heterogeneity of the data, the volume of the data, you know, the complexity of the data and other, you know, challenges. So, uh, uh, so another challenge, you know, which we see in this uh, uh, traditional data analysis methods which we need to overcome using data mining is the challenge of data ownership and distribution, right. So, basically we know that, you know, traditionally the data is mostly saved in one location, okay, and it is owned by one organization. But nowadays because, you know, we are looking at internet and we are looking at that uh, data can be, you know, generated, it can be stored, it can be distributed across multiple geographic locations, right, there can be multiple entities. So, this will require the development of distributed data mining techniques. So, now, you know, there are a number of challenges which are faced by distributed data mining algorithms, like how do we reduce the amount of communication needed to perform the distributed computation, right. So, because now the data is not at one place, so there definitely there has to be a lot of exchange which will happen. So, in order to consolidate the data and in order to consolidate the results, we need high degree of efficiency, right. Also, when data is not at one place, so another important concern will be of data security and privacy, right. That also needs to be addressed. So, non-traditional statistical approach will, you know, based on hypothesize and test paradigm. So, okay, in other words, hypothesis is proposed and experiment is designed to gather the data, right. What is, what is the non-traditional approach? That first you create a hypothesis, right, then you design an experiment and then you collect the data and using that data you, uh, you analyze with respect to the hypothesis whether it is true or it is not true, right. So, of course, this, this particular paradigm or this particular strategy is very highly labor intensive. Now, at this moment, what we are doing is that we have to generate and evaluate thousands of hypotheses, it's not one hypothesis because we are looking at, you know, multi-dimensional data sets. So, there will be multiple hypotheses which need to be tested at the same time, right, and therefore, we are looking for automation. We are looking for opportunities where, you know, we can look at this kind of samples and we can test multiple hypotheses using the same experimental design, right. So, therefore, this, all this, you know, all these challenges, they led to the development of the domain, to the origination of the domain of data mining. So, this data mining, actually, this field is come from, uh, you know, the area of knowledge discovery in databases. In the late 1980s, you know, the work started on this and then some of the conferences which were held, some of the workshops which were held, they brought together people from different disciplines actually. So, as I told in the last lecture also, data mining is a great combination of different di uh, disciplines you know, ranging from mathematics to statistics to computer sciences to database uh, data sciences, all these people, you know, they come together and they find out techniques which are best for discovering knowledge from large databases, right. So, this is actually built upon methodologies and algorithms, right, and the researchers were previously using those methodologies and, or, uh, you know, the algorithms, but now those have been combined with the domain of statistics, AI, pattern recognition, machine learning, right, and high performance parallel computing and also distributed techniques are helping to find this out. So, if you look at this, it clearly shows that data mining is actually a combination 
of statistics with all the other uh, you know AIML and pattern recognition sciences, right. So, it is basically a confluence of multiple disciplines which works together in case of data mining to discover the undiscovered knowledge from the large data sets, right. So, data science basically data mining is you know a part of the discipline of data science that is also highly interdisciplinary and that also uses tools and techniques for deriving insights from the data, right. So, data science is also an emerging field, right and it has got its own distinct identity, right. So, there, there, is, there is some degree of you know commonality between the data science and your data mining area. So, data sciences is growing up even faster, right, because it is also using broad range of computational, mathematical and statistical skills which are required in this area. Also, you know, the main reason why we are looking at all this is because social media and the web, they are presenting such opportunities for social scientists to observe and measure human behavior on large scales, right. Earlier, it was not possible to, you know, look at the behavior of 1 million people in one go, right. But now, it is possible because there are social media platforms which are having people, you know, having more than a million subscribers. So, you and you, you, you are able to note that behavior. So, such kind of skills are being developed like natural language processing or network analysis or statistics and data mining which are, which allow the social scientists also they give an opportunity to the social scientists to look at that kind of uh, you know behavioral problems the to study the group behavior sociology psychology all these fields you know they are they are benefiting from this kind of data driven approach right so basically the discovery of patterns and relationships from data especially in large quantities of data and this also without the need of extensive domain knowledge so this is very important that you know the data mining techniques that are being used they are irrespective of the domain knowledge so a person a data mining uh, you know a statistician or a, a data analyzer he may not have any knowledge of genetic engineering or biology, but still he can use the data to find out very useful information to find out, uh, you know, unknown knowledge or not, you know, undiscovered patterns between that data. So, after we understand, you know, what all is possible, what all is possible and what all can be done using data mining tasks, it is important to understand how these things are done, right. So, what exactly are the approaches or what are the procedures, what are the tasks which are undertaken as data mining tasks. So, there are two main categories of data mining tasks that we look at. The first category is the predictive task. And the second category are the descriptive tasks. So, these are the two main, you know, uh, areas or two main categories in which we will put all the functions which are performed under the head of data mining, right. So, first and foremost, we look at the predictive task. Now, prediction we already know. Prediction means to forecast the value of something which is going to happen in the future, like, like we say. Uh, prediction of weather, right. So, before you know like tomorrow's weather or day after's weather or the weather after one month can be predicted using particular techniques. So, these techniques basically the predictive tasks you know they will predict the value of a particular attribute based on the values of other attributes, right. So, the attribute uh, is which is predicted is known as the dependent variable and the attribute which is used for making the prediction is known as the independent or explanatory variable, right. So, one of the examples of this could be, uh, you know, predicting the value of agricultural production given the value of rainfall in a particular area. So, if we have, you know, the data of say 10 years or 15 years of the amount of agricultural production that took place in one particular area and the amount of rainfall that helped keeping all the other factors 
constant right so that means that agricultural production is a dependent variable and rainfall is an independent variable so we are trying to predict the amount of agricultural production that is our target variable using the amount of rainfall which is our our explanatory variable right so what we are doing we are actually trying to derive some pattern the pattern could be a correlation it could be a trend it could be trajectory or it could be an anomaly also right so we are actually trying to look at some kind of relationship between the data right so these are often you know the uh, descriptive tasks that we are looking at they are actually exploratory in nature right so they require post processing techniques to validate and explain the results because the predictive tasks they are going to use the uh, more of the quantitative methods descriptive tasks are going to use more of the qualitative techniques right so if you look at the four core data mining tasks that we look at the one is the association analysis right then we have the anomaly detection then we have the predictive methods and we have cluster analysis so basically these are four main types of tasks which are performed when you get a data set now which task will be used whether you will use anomaly or whether you will use association will depend upon the structure and format of the data that you are getting for processing right so if we look at predictive modeling first so in case of predictive modeling as we just saw that we are trying to build a model for the target variable and the function target variable is a function of the explanatory variable like we are saying that agricultural production is a function of the rainfall in the particular area so there are two main types of predictive tasks that we look at the first is the classification which is used for discrete target variable discrete target variable means that where the value is like in a binary format there is a fixed value right like color of a flower so that is a discrete value regression is used for continuous target value so continuous target values means that there is not one particular value like for example the values of uh, uh, you know the the price of shares of a particular company so those values they will keep on changing they are a function of time so with time the value will go on changing whereas if you say the color of a person's hair so that is a discrete variable that is not going to be continuous that is one value is enough right so predicting whether a web user will make a purchase at an online bookstore is a classification task because the target value is a binary value right so we are using either yes or no right but likewise i just said that predicting the price of a stock is regression task because price is a continued valued continuous valued attribute right so both task whether it is you know continuous or whether it is discrete whether it is regression or whether it is you know the other technique basically the objective is to minimize the error between the predicted and the true value right so predictive modeling can be used to identify customers who will be you know who will respond to a particular marketing campaign it can be used for uh, predicting disturbances in the ecosystem right or to judge whether a patient will have a particular disease based on the medical results or not right so a uh, very interesting example of you know uh, the uh, predictive technique is to predict the type of flower now this task this example has been used in the books also uh, that you know the particular characteristics of a flower uh, you looking at the characteristics of the flower the system can predict the species of the flower okay so basically we are trying to classify a flower say uh, the flower is the iris flower okay and one of the three species of so iris flower has actually three species which we are looking at first is the setosa the second species is versicolor and the third species is the virginica right and how do we classify between these three species so there are particular attributes which differ 
like first attribute which we look at is the petal width, the width of the petal. So, the petal width could be a low, a medium or a high width petal, right. Then the next characteristic is petal length, again that can be low, medium or high, right. So, based on these two categories that is the length of the petal and the width of the petal, uh, you know the species can be identified. So, if petal width is low and petal length is also low, it means it is setosa. If both are medium, it means it is versicolor and if both width and high uh, length of the petal is high, it means it is virginica, right. So, this data chart, this graph what we are seeing here, it is plotting the petal width and the petal length of 150 iris flowers, okay. So, if you look at this, uh, graph, it clearly, you know, it clearly creates three segments, okay. So, the first where both petal width and petal length are low is clearly segregated, okay. But the other two where, you know, the medium and high, there is certain area where there is a mix. That means, the prediction rate or the differentiation rate between the two species that is versicolor and virginica is not as precise as it is with setosa, right. So, this, this database is actually, you know, this is available online, uh, this uh, entire data set is available online and using that data set, this kind of plot has been plotted, right. So, basically what we are trying to prove here is that, you know, you can predict the species of the flower looking at the attributes of petal length and petal width, but there will be because we want to minimize the error. So, in certain samples the error will be minimized, there will be very less chance of an error, but in certain data sets the error when you know when the proximity or when the segregation of the data or when the data is too near each other, then there are chances of some kind of overlap between the two species, right. Another important analysis that we can do is the association analysis. Now, this association analysis is also used to discover patterns which describe, you know, which strongly associated features in the data, right. Now, the discovered data are typically represented in the form of implication rules or future subset, right. So, as you know, we go on moving because of the exponential size of the space, uh, you know, the search space because our data set is growing, you know, uh, enormously. So, association analysis is used to extract very interesting patterns which are there, which are present there, right. So, this can be used for finding groups of genes which have similar functionality or web pages which will be accessed together or, you know, uh, two products which will be bought together by the customer. So, this is another very interesting example of association exam, uh, you know, analysis where we are looking at the uh, point of sale data on the checkout counter of a grocery store. So, if we look at these 10 transactions which are taking place, it is an important, you know, uh, association that comes out to be and the association is that in all the 10 transaction, wherever milk is being purchased, diapers are being purchased. So, these two products are being purchased together, that is milk and diapers, because the, you know, it somewhere it implies that the customer who has got young children is buying milk and therefore is buying diapers also. So, this type of association can be unraveled using an association technique. So, this will help, you know, Mm, this will help the, uh, the grocery store person or the manager to place these two things together because this knowledge has come to, you know, the system, the, the knowledge has come to the management of the store that the two products are being bought together most number of times than other, right. So, it can be applied for this kind of product. So, it will, uh, you know, it is used to identify uh, cross-selling opportunities among related item. So, otherwise, you know, milk and diapers are not related, but this is, this is like cross-selling. One, when one person is buying one product, the same person generally buys the other product also. So, this can be used to enhance, you know, the sale of both the product. Then, another type of analysis is the cluster analysis which is done. 
Now, in cluster analysis, the cluster basically means that we are trying to find groups of closely related observations, right. So, we are looking at observations which belong to the same group or they are similar to each other, right. So, clustering has been used to group sets of related customers, right, that is to find out another example is to find out areas of the ocean that have significant impact of earth's climate or sometimes to compress data. Now, an example of you know clustering could be document clustering. So, if we look at document clustering, so we are looking at a collection of news articles which can be grouped based on their respective topics, right. So, if we have you know an article right so we find out the frequency of a particular word which is coming in that article right so we we develop a function w is to c where w is a word and c is the number of times the word appears in the article right so here we find in this if we can see we find that you know if we find the word and frequency so these are 10 newspaper articles that we are looking at and we are grouping them based on their respective topics. So, looking at the word frequency, we can find out the topic of the article, right. So, we see that in certain articles, the words dollar, industry, you know, loan, government are coming more number of times and there is another group in which patient, symptom, drug, health, doctor, clinic are coming more number of times. So, we can say that, you know, looking at this frequency of a particular set of words which is coming in the article, we can form two clusters of this article. The first cluster is talking about is you know basically those uh, of the articles which correspond to news about the economy and we make a second cluster which contains the articles corresponding to news about healthcare. Right. So, a good clustering algorithm is the one which is able to identify these two clusters based on similarity between the words that appear in the article. So, we, we are trying to develop an algorithm which will look at the words, which will look at the similarity between the words and their meanings and the frequency with which at which each of the word is coming. So, they can you know like using this kind of clustering algorithm, we can use to segregate articles or we can use to segregate observations into groups or clusters. The next type of technique which is very commonly used is the anomaly detection technique. Now, what is anomaly? Anomaly basically you know the other uh, synonym of anomaly could be abnormality or something which is not following the usual pattern, which is you know uh, an observation whose characteristics are very different from the rest of the data. That is called anomaly, right. In data, we also in data science, we also use the word outlier, right. In statistics also outliers are used, that is which is not a part, which is not coming together with the rest of the observation, right. So, these outliers or these anomalies have to be detected, right. They have to be detected, they have to be identified, right. So, a good anomaly detector will have a high detection rate and a low false alarm rate because sometimes there, there are anomaly, there is an outlier, but there is no significant meaning attached to that particular observation. But at other times, there can be only one or two outliers, but still they will carry an important piece of information, particularly you know like for example, in disease detection, if most of the people are not showing a symptom, but one or two people are still showing the symptom, those two people could be the potential carriers of the spread of the disease, right. So, likewise uh, you know anomaly detection is very, very important in the case of uh, credit card uh, fraud detection, right. Uh, also, in case of network intrusions or unusual patterns of diseases as I just said or some kind of ecosystem disturbances like droughts and failures. So, one of the important uh, areas and examples of credit card uh, uh, fraud detection is anomaly detection because most of the credit card companies, they you know, they keep a credit card, uh, they keep a profile of all their 
customer. So, they, they know you know about the age, annual income, address, personal information about the uh, credit card holders and if they ever see any transaction which is you know very different in nature than the usual transactions pattern of the customer then that could be an alarm that could be you know a potential fraud and therefore an alarm will be raised by the company. Now, this is only possible because the company, the credit card company is having a profile of all the customers, all the transactions which are taken, taken by the customer in that case. So, therefore, whenever new transaction will come, it will compare against the profile of that user. And if the characteristics are very different from the previously created profile, then the transaction will be flagged as potential fraud. So, therefore, this way of anomaly detection is also very important area where data mining techniques can play a great role in you know uh, solving business and bank related fraud activities. So, this will be all for today's lecture. We shall be continuing on data mining in the uh, subsequent lectures. Till then, please keep watching CEC. Thank you.